So here we are this evening as we come to the final uh, <coughs> days of uh, Passion Week in relation to the, the last seven days of the Lord Jesus' earthly ministry. And on Friday we looked at, uh, Friday was the day of acclaim when the Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem for the first time to present himself as king. And then on the Saturday, the day of anointing, when he was at uh, the house of uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we looked on the Sunday, then the day of proclamation, when he returned again to the city. And uh, Zechariah 9.9 9 again, Behold your king cometh. And the Lord Jesus, when he's coming up to the city, he weeps over that. And then on Monday was the day of authority when the Pharisees and Sadducees accused him and said, where do you get this authority? And uh, the Lord Jesus uh, spoke to them and uh, confronted them and gave the parables, the various teachings that he did and performed miracles in the temples with healing. He cursed the fig tree, remember that uh, miracle of destruction that he did and we spoke about how he hungered and how he wept and thirsted and so forth and then in Matthew 23 the woes that he pronounced on the, on the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders he called them the hypocrites the actors and um, again as he left the city for the final time how he wept again and he said oh Jerusalem Jerusalem how often would I have gathered thee as a hen gathers her chickens but you would not come and then he went back to Bethany and this time he went to the house of Simon the leper. And there the lady anointed him again with the alabaster box of oil. And how it was recorded in the word of God that the good deed that she had done, that that would be shared in the Gospels. And then Tuesday. Well, Tuesday was the preparation for the Passover. And we looked at that. That was the day of preparation. And you got to remember in the Jewish clock, their day changes from 6 p.m. sunset uh, is the start of their new day and not 12 o'clock the way our, our clock works. And then we looked as well at Wednesday. Uh, we're into then the day of agony. And we spoke there that how late then on the Wednesday evening after, after the Passover, you get all that teaching in John's Gospel, how the Passover meal he instituted the New Testament, the New Covenant in his blood. He shared that with them. He gave them another commandment that they were to love one another. And how he thought, did that all that teaching. But Judas then, he betrayed him with a kiss. And it says in John's Gospel, he went out and it was night. And indeed he gave him that, uh, uh, the kiss then in the garden, that kiss of death. And Judas, of course, we know the Lord said it had been better for him if he had never been born and how then he was in the garden and uh, he sweat great drops of blood and agony as he contemplated what lay before him and the sufferings on the cross and all that was going to take place and we spoke briefly about the six mock trials that the saviour went through totally against the word of god tried a man at night actually asked him to accuse himself to condemn himself which is totally against the Jewish laws that God had given them. And these were the high priests, the um, the elders, the Sanhedrin, all except uh, Ananias and Nicodemus, who, uh, or Joseph of Arimathea uh, and Nicodemus, who would not uh, condemn Christ. And they stood uh, for the Lord Jesus. So there he is before the Sanhedrin. And they took him then to Pilate uh, to get him judged, uh, to change the, the, from blasphemy, you remember, the curse to treason, so that the Rome would have a reason to put him to death. Pilate sent him then to Herod, Herod mocked him, and then back again to Pilate, and Pilate uh, released onto them Barabbas, which is a picture of substitution. Release, released Barabbas, and they uh, crucified Christ. And we're going to read here uh, from Matthew chapter 27. And I'm going to read here from verse uh, 26 of Matthew chapter 27. Then released he Barabbas unto them, that's Pilate, 
And when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And you can imagine that the Lord Jesus has had no sleep. He's had eight mock trials and now here he is being battered by the Romans. It says in verse 29, And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Heal, King of the Jews, what humiliation. And they spat upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own garment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots, and sitting down they watched him there. Uh, crucifixion was the most horrible death that any human person uh, could endure. Crucifixion was never for a Roman. It was all was for uh, Jews or barbarians, never for Roman citizens. And of course we know the Lord Jesus was indeed the king uh, of the Jews. It was a horrible death. It took a man anything from up till three to seven days to die of crucifixion, uh, of suffocation. It was such a horrible death, such a painful, excruciating death. And that's what they did to the Lord Jesus. And then verse 37, it says... And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves uh, crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that dost destroy the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders. There's the whole Jewish nation represented here mocking the Saviour said. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same on his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. The Lord Jesus was placed on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning. He's been hanging there in pain and in agony to twelve o'clock uh, midday. And then now at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon... He's, there's three hours of complete and utter darkness and we'll speak briefly about that in a moment of two. And it said on about the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let him be. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, this is past tense, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. 
Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also uh, himself was Jesus' disciple. Uh, he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, and then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. And uh, there we have the story of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The crucifixion of our glorious Saviour. Here is the zenith uh, of his ministry. He came for this purpose. Uh, this is the, the day that God had set aside in the great plan of eternity in his heart when the Lord Jesus would die for the sins uh, of the whole world. And uh, there's, there's so much really. You need to read all the Gospels to get a full picture of the sufferings and of, the, of all that the Lord Jesus endured on this day. And uh, it's truly incredible what the Saviour went through for us. John's Gospel says in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, here the Lord Jesus is fulfilling that prophetic word. This is the hour of the day of crucifixion when God's Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, is suffering and dying in substitution for the sins of the whole world. And it's amazing how the Lord fulfilled the prophetic scriptures in relation to everything concerning himself. And the Lord Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the Passover Lamb given in the Word of God. The Passover lamb was to be chosen and set apart on the 10th day of the first month of Nisan according to the word of God. And the fulfillment was on the 10th day of Nisan. The Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey and was hailed as the king of the Jews. The lamb was to be inspected for four days until the 14th day of the month to see if there was any spot or any blemish that it it might disqualify it as a sacrificial lamb and that was fulfilled openly because the Lord Jesus taught in the holy temple in the synagogues until the 14th day of the month and they could find no fault in him. And at the appointed time, that's uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the Passover lambs were slain by the whole congregation of Israel and that was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus, God's sacrificial lamb. And he was delivered and publicly killed on a Roman cross, that execution stake, as the, the Passover lambs were being slaughtered uh, at three o'clock on that afternoon. And there the Lord Jesus was crucified as God's lamb outside the city walls. And uh, in that three hours of darkness, we've spoke of that previously, from 12 o'clock midday to three o'clock, when the sun refused to shine, uh, there the Lord Jesus became sin for us. He that knew no sin might become sin for us, that we could become the righteousness of God. And there in those three hours of darkness, the Lord Jesus, the Trinity, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there was a separation. Uh, for the Lord Jesus was separated from the Father for those three hours when he became sin for us. And he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. It's hard to imagine just the depths that the Saviour went and the lengths that he went to to save us from our sin. The pain and the agony and the separation. Is it only any wonder he cried out, Oh my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
and thank God that he paid that price. They were crying him, come down from the cross. They said, if you be the Son of God, thank the Lord he didn't come down from the cross, but he hung, he bled, he died, he suffered, and he paid the price for our sins. And then uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and they took uh, his body, the body of Christ, they took him down from the cross, and they placed him into this new tomb. They had to get him, uh, get him down from the cross uh, before the Passover uh, day, and uh, get him into the tomb. And that's what they were at. And they did that, and they placed him in this new tomb, where never a man lay, and they rolled the stone before it. And they got him out of view, and got him out of sight, and they thought that was the end of him. They thought it was all over, and everything would 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 settle down but you know i was just thinking <coughs> it says we read in the word of god there about the rent veil the veil in the temple was rent from the top uh, to the bottom uh, in verse 51 and you know that's a picture of the rent heart of the father uh, whenever the high priest a sign of mourning he rent the rain their garments, that's what they do, they pull the sleeve out of the coats. And I believe there the father, his heart was so broken over the judgment upon his son for sin and the substitution that he rent the veil, uh, a sign of mourning of the father's heart. Indeed there as the way was made open into the holiest of holies, that the sinner can go into the presence of Christ, for he indeed is our great high priest. So the burial, they buried him. And we read all about that in the four Gospels. So really Good, good Friday should be changed to Good Wednesday. Eh, for, for that's really when it happened. We read in Matthew's Gospel, eh, chapter 12, verse 40. For as jo eh, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So if he was crucified on the Friday, he would need to be in longer than Sunday to be three full days and three full nights. But this is the the, the days that it happened he was crucified uh, on the Wednesday. So the Lord Jesus descended. He descended into the paradise compartment of Hades or hell. Remember he said to the thief on the cross, Today you'll be with me in paradise in Luke twenty three, forty three. So although the Lord Jesus is out of sight, he's down in the depths of the earth. We read that in Ephesians four, eight to ten. He's preaching the gospel down in the depths of the earth to the Old Testament saints, to Moses and to all those Old Testament saints that died in Christ in faith according to the law according to God's word and obedience and there in those two compartments there's the the hell place compartment of torments where uh, the rich man is remember we read about him in Luke 16 and then there's the other compartment Abraham's bosom in paradise and this is where the Old Testament saints are gathered because they couldn't go to heaven uh, because the Lord Jesus hadn't died at that stage and he's the first fruits but he preached the gospel to them and shared the word of God. So we're in then <clears throat> now to Thursday. And Thursday is the day of absence. Thursday is the day of absence. There's no there's no Lord Jesus. We read in John's Gospel <clears throat> on chapter nineteen, verse thirty one. Uh, I think it's important just to bring this out. It says uh, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was on high day. That's different than the weekly Sabbath. This was the high day, the Passover day, uh, the next day, because Pilate uh, had their leg, that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So this distinguishes this, this uh, Sabbath from the weekly Sabbath. So here's the days of absence and the day of Passover, which is the 14th day of Nisan. Uh, the Jews still celebrate that today, indeed, the festival of unleavened bread. 
And then we come then to the three days of silence. The three days of silence. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, silence. But then we come in to Sunday morning. Sunday morning, surprise. The Roman soldiers have been uh, keeping guard. We read that from verse 62. It says now in Matthew 27, Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last hour shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sailing the stone and setting <coughs> a watch. So there you have the Roman guard. Uh, the greatest army in the known world, uh, four soldiers per watch, watching the tomb, uh, making sure that no one tampers with it, how the Lord has used this. Um, so no one dare go near that because it would have been immediate death if anybody was to tamper with the Roman seal. And there's the Roman soldiers setting guard, watching over it to make sure that nobody can get in. But little did they realize that they're fulfilling scripture and uh, that they're making the resurrection so authentic as well by their presence there. So then we have, we come in <coughs> to Matthew chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, that's the weekly Sabbath now, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Here's these uh, Roman legion soldiers, the elite in the army, fell dead, uh, fell to the ground like dead men, frightened. Uh, wimpin. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified, past tense. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Here we have this wonderful uh, account of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And here we see that uh, the angels who cannot lie proclaimed that the Lord Jesus is alive. He's alive. Praise the Lord this morning. We worship a risen Saviour. He's in the world today. He's alive and alive in the power of an endless life. The, de the grave it couldn't hold him and death could not destroy him. He is not here, Luke says, uh, but he has risen. Hallelujah. He's alive and alive forevermore. And we see here the empty tomb <coughs> displayed it. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel 28 and 6 we read there the angel said for he is not here he is written risen as he said come see the place where the Lord lay and we read in the other Gospels how they went and looked in and seen nothing only the grave clothes you can imagine the sight uh, that he had been wrapped in the linen grave clothes and placed his body in the tomb and all that they seen was the grave clothes, just like the cocoon of the butterfly. Uh, the body was gone, and there was only the, just the grave clothes there, just where the Lord had been lying. Isn't it really incredible, remarkable, wonderful? And the Lord Jesus has disappeared out of those grave clothes because he's alive and alive forevermore. And then, not only... 
<coughs> did the empty tomb display it, but the appearance says of the, the risen Lord himself confirmed it. The Lord Jesus confirmed his appearances. If we were to go into uh, Luke's gospel here, just for a moment of two, Luke 24, and uh, we read here from, from verses uh, 15. And here's the story of the two in the Emmaus road. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Isn't that a wonderful little cameo here? Here's these two individuals and they're heading back to the Emmaus village, which is three score furlongs from Jerusalem. And they're talking together of all that had happened. And the Lord Jesus himself draws near and enters in to the conversation and he starts at Moses and he expounds the word of God and the prophets and all the scriptures concerning himself. What a Bible study that was. And then the two, they say, look, it's, it's late in the day. Come on in, have something to eat with us. And when they brought him into the house and uh, then as he gave thanks, we read here in verse 30, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened unto us the scriptures? And they arose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared. To Simon, the Lord has risen indeed. There he is, a uh, walking. There he is, talking. There he is, eating. There he is, in fellowship. He's the risen Christ, the risen person, the Lord Jesus. And then you remember, he said that he would meet them uh, in Galilee, and uh, in John's Gospel, chapter twenty-one. We have that wonderful story there where he's at the, the Sea of Tiberias and uh, the disciples have went fishing and they're out on the boat and uh, just uh, as it's coming to dawn and they see the silhouette on the beach and uh, the Lord Jesus shouts over, Children, have you any food? Have you caught any fish? And they said, uh, No, not a thing. And he shouts over back to them, Cast your net out on the other side. And they cast the net over to the other side and they were not able to draw in for the multitudes of fishes and they recognised immediately this is the Lord. And of course Peter, Patches Peter there, he he, uh, he casts himself into the sea and he swims over to the meets the Saviour. And the Lord Jesus, there's a barbecue. He has the coals of fire lit, he has fish on it, he has bread. You know what, he has all they need. And he's there ready to feed them the bread of life himself. And uh, it's, it would not be some experience. And they're drawing in all these fish. And there's a little truth here in uh, John 21, 11. It said, And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there was uh, so many, yet was not and the net broken. That number in uh, Hebrew Biblical Numerology, uh, 150 and 3, and that actually translates in the Hebrew language to I am God. Isn't that amazing? The number of the fishes signify that it's God. I am God. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus is God. And there he is ready to meet his disciples uh, waiting for them to feed them in fellowship with them. And of course, that's where that's where Peter uh, is restored to the Lord. Uh, Lovest me more than these, Peter. And Peter denied the Lord three times. And then three times the Lord asked him, Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And we know that Peter was the greatest, one of the greatest evangelists ever. So then, <coughs> the appearances of the risen Lord. In Acts 1 and 3, 
<coughs> look at this to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion that means sufferings by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days 40 days the Lord Jesus showed himself and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God imagine for 40 days the Lord Jesus continued to teach and to preach the word of God and to live and show these disciples uh, the truth of the glorious resurrection 40 days of appearances is not amazing my I would have loved to have been there just to see the risen Christ walking talking fellowshipping eating 40 days he appeared uh, speaking to the things pertaining to the kingdom of God what a Bible study that would have been from the master himself 40 days of appearances and then <clears throat> we see in verse 9 we see his physical departure and when he had spoken these things that's the Lord Jesus while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel and there we have the story uh, of the Lord Jesus of his uh, departure from the brethren and there he is at the at the Mount of Olives uh, ascending up in the cloud up into heaven and he's uh, separated from them and uh, the angels then come to testify because they said here in verse 11 about the two angels and the white men in white apparel which also said ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey they returned with joy from the mountain knowing that the Lord Jesus eh, was going to return and there we read in verse 11 that there's the word the promise of his return dear friends he's gone but he's coming back he's the risen Christ he's no longer in the grave he's in the glory he's seated at the father's right hand a prince and a saviour and uh, our soon coming king and we are longing for and waiting for that blessed hope and that a glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ that Paul writes to Titus about <clears throat> but I want to look just in closing <clears throat> in uh, John 14 and 1 to 3 the Lord Jesus said to his disciples before his crucifixion and there's so much uh, in relation in John's gospel to about the, the Saviour's final hours but he said to them let not your heart be troubled. They were going away. He was going away. He was going to be crucified on the cross. He was leaving the disciples. And they were, they were downcast and downhearted. And he said to them, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive ye unto myself that where I am there ye may be also here we have in that lovely passage here in John 14 the answer for all troubled hearts there's the answer in the, in the precious word of God it let not your heart be troubled ye believe in God believe also in me for a man and woman to be in heaven you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we need to have faith in Christ because it's the Lord Jesus that uh, died on Calvary's cross he died the, the just for the unjust that he could bring us to the Father and it's faith in Christ that's needed not faith in idols not faith in ministers not faith in religion not faith in churches not faith in money not faith in works it's faith in a person none other than the Lord Jesus Christ and he said, if you believe in me, believe also in God, believe also in me. 
And then he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. You need faith in heaven, because heaven is the place where the Lord Jesus resides and abides, where the Father throne is he's in heaven it's the center of the universe in relation to god it's the throne room of heaven and that's where the father dwells and we need faith in christ and we need faith in heaven there's a better place than this world yes uh, covid 19 may take the body but bless god if you have your faith in christ heaven will take your soul and you'll be in heaven forever and forever And then we see here faith in his return. He says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Here is the prophetic word in relation uh, to the rapture of, of the saints of God. When the Lord Jesus himself, Paul reminds us in Thessalonians, for the Lord Jesus, he shall come to the air. There will be two stages for his coming. He's coming to the earth for the church and then he's coming to the earth with the church for the Jews and that could happen at any moment in time. The scene certainly has been set for the Lord's return. Uh, Look at all that's taking place. Remember from these words were first spoken there's over 2,000 years have passed and there's so much has taken place prophetically speaking. Israel is now back in the land. There's no more prophetic scriptures to be fulfilled in relation then to the coming to the air of the Lord Jesus for his church. And dear friend, if he was to come to the air tonight in the moment of a twinkling of an eye, the trumpet of God would sound and the Christians would be taken out, snatched away, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Would you be ready? Would you be ready to meet the Lord? Are you ready for heaven? Are you in Christ? Are you saved? You need to be born again of God's Holy Spirit. You need to repent of your sin and turn away from your sin and place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus to be sure that you'll be caught up because he's coming again. He has said it in his word, If I go, I will come again and receive who? Receive his children unto himself that where I am, there you may be also. People say, how can you know you'll be in heaven? Well, Jesus says that if he's there, you'll be there. And I believe indeed in the inerrant word of God, that where I am, Jesus says, there ye may be also. And he's in heaven at this moment of time. And for those that die in Christ, (coughs) there's the assurance that will be there with him. You know, man has three great sorrows, aren't there? sin and suffering and death and the lord jesus has dealt dealt with it all at the place called calvary he dealt with it all at the place called calvary he took her he took her sins didn't he and he took our sorrows and i was just amazed at what the lord jesus has done for us so there's three days of silence uh, thursday friday saturday And then Sunday, the day of appearances. And one day, he's going to appear again. And friend, can I just ask you in closing here, have you had a day of preparation? Have you prepared to meet the Lord? Have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and on his finished work at Calvary for the salvation of your soul? Are you prepared? As Amos says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? Have you made that preparation? Have you made your calling and election sure? Are you ready? If he was to come to the air tonight and blow and sound the trumpet, are you ready to go to be with the Lord? A day of preparation, a day of salvation. Paul says to the Corinthians in 6 and 2, he says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thank God that we're still in the day of salvation, the day of grace. And this is a day when men and women uh, can repent, a day of repentance. You can repent of sin and come to Christ this even this very evening and place your faith and trust in him. You know, he took our sin and our sorrow and he made it his very own. 
And friends, one day there will be a day of rejoicing. Hallelujah. For the Christian, we have this blessed hope. When the Bible talks about a blessed hope, it's not a hope so. It means it's an absolute certainty. A blessed hope in the scriptures is an absolute certainty. As sure as God is sure, there will be a day of rejoicing. One day the, the race will be run, the battles will be over. We'll have passed up into the heavens to be with Christ forever. A day of rejoicing is coming. The day of redemption draweth nigh. Praise God. We have something wonderful to look forward to as believers. I was just thinking about the Lord Jesus and all he endured on the cross and was thinking about my own life. You know, whenever we're born, <clears throat> we're just like a white sheet of F4 paper with one little dot on it. Black dot. We're born in sin and shaping in iniquity. And whilst we're born innocent, as an F4 page, there's a little black dot that we inherited from the Adam's nature called sin. There's none of us sinless and none of us spotless. The only one who was sinless was Christ. He was born completely sinless. There was no blemish on his page. There was no blemish on his paper. But we were blemished. There was a little dot of black sin, uh, the sin we inherited from Adam on our lives at conception. And you know, as we grew as little children and <clears throat> we become a little older, there was more sin. And little by little, as we learned uh, to lie and as we grew up, the sin became more and more. The page became marred with more sin. It became more black till eventually, as we got older and older, the page, instead of becoming white, it became black. Totally perforated blackness. And to believe there on the cross, that's a picture of our sin when God's sun refused to shine. And in that darkness, in that blackness, the Lord Jesus, that white heart of Christ, became black with our sin, putrefied with sin. And he bore our sin in his own body on the tree. And that white picture of holiness and godliness was made putrefying black with the sin of the whole world laid upon him. The spotless Lamb of God became black and putrid with sin. The very thing that he hated and detested most, he became for us. He became sin for us that we indeed could become white before God. And his precious blood, praise God, paid the price that God was able to cleanse us. And the Lord Jesus rose from the grave, white, pure, holy, righteous, true, a new resurrection, resurrected body, and he's rose, and he lives in the power of an endless life. And it's called the righteousness of Christ. Whenever a man or woman comes to Christ, and it's like what he does is, he takes that black A4 page of her sin, that life of sin, and he places it in the white envelope and seals it. And that's just a picture of us when we're in Christ and we're in robed and clothed in his righteousness. And he cleanses us from all our sin and he puts us in Christ and we're sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit and we're cleansed of all sin. And if you were to open that white envelope and pull out that A4 page, it's no longer black, but it's white, it's clean, it's pure, it's holy, because he has imputed unto us his righteousness, his holiness, his purity, his sinlessness, and we have the righteousness of God in him, and God accepts us in Christ. We need to be in the envelope. He accepts us in Christ, not outside of Christ, but in Christ, because it's only in Christ that we can be cleansed from all our sin. Oh, hallelujah, what a glorious and wonderful Saviour. So on this wonderful Sunday that we remember, this resurrection uh, Sunday, uh, he is not here, he is risen. He's alive, come see the place where the Lord lay. So we bless God for that uh, Passion Week, that week of uh, all that 
the Lord Jesus endured that climax of his ministry, all that he went through, all that he endured. We need to read all the Gospels to get a full uh, picture of what actually he went through, and yet it's only a small snippet of what took place. And we never know until we get to glory the depths of agony and pain and all it cost our Saviour and the Father and the Holy Spirit to deal and cleanse our sin. Bless God, we have a wonderful Saviour who's in the glory today. And thank God he's coming again, coming for me. And praise God, coming for all his saints. And so we just encourage any that's listening, that if you're not ready, prepare to meet the Lord. For he could come to the earth at any moment. And would you be ready to be with him? I pray and trust that you will. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you accomplished for us at the place called Calvary. Thank you for your precious blood that you shed to pay that price. Thank you for being God's sacrificial lamb. Thank you for there in Calvary uh, when you were mocked and scorned and beaten and battered and unrecognizable on that cross. Thank you that you endured all that horrendous suffering and anguish if because of your love for us, your love for sinners. And thank you for going to the cross for each and every one of us. But we bless thee that the grave couldn't hold thee and death couldn't destroy thee. And that on the third day you rose again. And today you live in the power of an endless life. And you're coming soon. Coming for your church whom you've purchased with your own blood. And coming to rule and coming to reign. And coming back to this earth again. So Lord Jesus we praise thee. And we give thee our thanks and we ask you'll help us uh, to go on with thee and to rejoice in your tremendous love. We ask this all, our Father, giving you thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen.